Okay, so uh, maybe it's just the uh, television uh, programming that I watch, uh, which is certainly possible, but there's this recurring advertisement that I keep seeing by the Prudential Insurance Company, and it's got this professorial type guy, bald head, glasses, kind of a, you know, a two-day beard sort of thing, and he always asks this question, how much money do you think you'll need when you retire? And, uh, and then people like suggest certain amounts and they cut ribbons, I think they're like yellow ribbons or something, and then they stretch them and they, and they figure out they don't stretch far enough and then he you know, kind of shows them how they can save $5 million and you know, live like a king the rest of their life and, and all the rest of that. And I was thinking about that and I thought, you know what, we as a, as a culture, we, are, we spend a lot of time thinking about retirement. And uh, what, an, what an interesting phenomena that really is and how different that is than most of the rest of the world, right? You know, we talk about how much money do I need to live for the next 30 years without ever working a day? What a strange world. What a strange world. We spend a lot of time thinking about that, but, but beloved, we don't spend as much time as, as we ought to spend thinking about how to invest the resources that Christ has entrusted to us. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 25. We're in verses 14 to 30 this morning. And, uh, and want to talk about stewardship. I want to talk about investing because Jesus is talking about investing. Jesus is talking about it. Now, contextually, we're, we're here. We're still in the Olivet Discourse, right? Chapter 25, chapters 24 and 25 of Matthew's Gospel, the Olivet Discourse. It, it concerns the nation of Israel at the end of the age. And we have gone over it in, in quite a bit of detail in terms of, of what, is, what is prophetically going to happen to among the nation of Israel during those dark days of the tribulation period. And the, and, and the theme of that just continues to flow through these chapters. Let me just kind of remind you of this a little bit. Verse 36 of, of chapter 24 where Jesus says of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, right, nor the Son, but the Father alone. He's talking about the second coming. He's talking about his return, his return to bring an end to that, that terrible time of tribulation and to establish his earthly kingdom, his millennial kingdom, his thousand-year rule, the reign of the Son of David upon the throne of David on the earth. And he says of coming. But when, at that moment in time, no one knows, it lies with God. When he returns, he goes on to say in verses 37 to 41 of chapter 24, when I return, when the king comes, it will be too late for many. Your position will be established at that point. You will either be a citizen of the kingdom and you will be welcomed in, or you will be snatched away into judgment. And he talks about that, and he uses the, the, the uh, illustration of the, the flood coming in the days of Noah and how the world was snatched away in judgment. They were washed away in judgment, the coming of the flood. He said it will be the same way when the Son of Man comes. Therefore, the only proper response, verse 42, chapter 24, is to be alert, to be, to be looking for, to be prepared for the coming of the king. Don't Fall asleep, but, but be prepared. In fact, what he says further in, verses, in verse 45 is that to be alert is to, is to be two things. It's to be faithful and it's to be prudent or sensible. That's what it means to be alert. When we are to be alert, and he's speaking, uh, he's speaking to, the, to the Jewish nation that will be alive at the time of his coming, but, but by application he is speaking to us, and through this whole section... Uh, I don't want to have to keep saying that. He is speaking to them, but, he is a, but the application can be legitimately made to us. He is saying that to be alert is to be prudent and to be faithful. Prudence, he further goes on to define in chapter 25, verses 1 through 13 that we looked at last week, is to be prepared. That's what it means to be prudent. To be prudent, to be sensible, to be wise is to be prepared like the five virgins were who had enough oil in the story to, to uh, relight their lamps at the coming of the bridegroom. He will talk to us this morning in verses 14 to 30 about what it means to be faithful. What is faithfulness? 
And faithfulness is, in according to the parable he will tell us here, is to be a good steward. Faithfulness is about stewardship. And so the parable before us this morning, verses 14 through 30, is a parable about good stewardship. Closing out the chapter, just so you kind of see how it fits, in verses 31 to, uh, to 46, the, the final judgment here, that what's called the sheep and the goat judgment, is a further illustration of faithfulness. And there, faithfulness is illustrated by about caring for those who are in need. And in particular, caring for those Jewish people alive during the tribulation who are being severely persecuted by the, Messiah, or by the Antichrist. All right? So, prudence, faithfulness, today, faithfulness, faithfulness, stewardship. The topic before us this morning is stewardship. Now, if you've been around the church for any length of time and the pastor says, I want to preach to you this morning about stewardship, immediately what you think is, okay, so he's going to talk to me about how much money I put in the offering plate, right, when it goes around, and, uh, and then he'll probably talk about uh, how much money the church spends, and we need, to, we need to either spend more or save more, and I need to put more in the plate and all the rest of that, okay? Rest at ease. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. Because that's not what the parable's about. The parable's bigger, broader, deeper, way more convicting. Way more convicting <laughs> than that. You don't get off the hook by writing a simple check. Okay? Actually, that's easy. It's way more convicting than that. We're talking about stewardship. Stewardship is not about saving. Stewardship is about investing. Stewardship is not about saving. Stewardship is about investing, and it's about investing in the gospel. Investing where God establishes his priorities. And the measure of stewardship is a measure of faithfulness. And said the other way, a measure of faithfulness is the measure of our stewardship. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, according to the English Standard Version, says this is how one should regard us, Paul says, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found what? Faithful. Faithful. Stewardship is about faithfulness. Now, this is a parable. This is a, a story. This is something Jesus has made up. He makes up this story in order to drive home a single point. A single point. What is the, the parable? What is the setting of the parable? It's simply this. There is a wealthy master who is leaving on a journey, and before he leaves on the journey, he entrusts to three of his slaves a certain portion of his wealth. And he calls, when he, when he returns, he calls upon each slave to give an accounting for what they have done with what he has entrusted to them, to give an accounting of their faithfulness. Now, the point of comparison here, this is, a, this is a parable that's about the coming kingdom. The point of the parable is simply this. When the kingdom comes, there will be an accounting. When the kingdom comes, there will be an accounting of each and every living soul upon the earth. Everyone will give an account. For the Jews at that time, the time of the Messiah's return, they will give their accounting. They will, they will pass through their judgment as it is spoken of in Ezekiel chapter 20 and verses 33 to 38. They pass under the shepherd's rod. Those who are found faithful in this context enter into Messiah's kingdom. Those that are not are taken away into judgment. Chapter 25, beginning in verse 31 and to the end of verse 46, is a judgment of the living Gentiles at the time of the return of the king, and they will be judged for their faithfulness, for their stewardship, in how they treated Jesus' brethren. And in this context, it is the Jewish people who are being severely persecuted during the seven years by the Antichrist. 
they will show their stewardship by how they responded to the least of those who were in terrible affliction. Okay? The big question, the big question of this parable is, what have you been doing while I was away? What is the parable about? The parable is about this. What have you been doing while I was away? What have you been doing? Because, beloved, what we do in this life has massive implications for the next. Massive implications. And so, let's take a look at what Jesus has for us here. He unfolds the parable, and as he does so, we're going to see a vivid illustration of what Jesus requires of those who claim to be his children. Okay? My outline here this morning is, uh, is really simple. It's, it's this. There is one requirement, two approaches, one response. One requirement, two approaches, one response. Okay? So, beginning here in verse 14 with one requirement. For it, that is the kingdom of heaven, is just like a man about to go on a journey, who called his own slaves and entrusted his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, each according to his own ability, and he went on his journey. He calls his slaves, doulas. He calls the slaves, and as was common in that day, he entrusts to them a certain portion of his wealth. The slave class at this time, as we've said before, could be made up of people who are very well educated, very competent, very very good in in all kinds of, of various areas of knowledge. And so he calls together these slaves and he entrusts wealth to them and he expects them to do something with it. That's the scenario. He entrusts, what it says here, is a talent. Five talents to the first slave, Two talents to the next slave, one talent to the third slave. Now, a talent is a unit of measurement. It is a, it is a unit of measurement for weight. A talent ranged between 75 and 100 pounds. It was the amount of weight a soldier was expected to carry on their back. That would be a talent. It became applied as a monetary measure. It could be a talent of gold, it could be a talent of silver, it could be a talent of copper. So it would be somewhere between 75 and 100 pounds of gold, silver, or copper, one talent. Now before you pull out your smartphone and make quick calculations to bring it into today's currency, let me try this with you. One talent was equal to 6,000 denarii. That was the exchange rate. One talent, 6,000 denarii. A denarius was the amount that a common laborer would be paid for a single day's work. One denarii per day for a common laborer. Therefore, one talent would equal 6,000 days' work, or approximately 20 years of labor. Okay? So now you get an idea of the size of the money that we are talking about. Massive sums are being entrusted to these slaves. This is a story. This is a story, and Jesus is making the story very, very vivid by using these really exaggerated amounts of money, okay? To one slave is is entrusted a a hundred years' worth of labor. To another slave is entrusted 40 years' worth of labor. To another, 20 years' worth of labor. You get an idea. Now, in our our language, talent refers to God-given endowments, right? God-given endowments, uh, certain abilities, certain skills. We call it our talents. Um, and many commentators kind of picking up on that, uh, try to, to, uh, to narrow down here and say that the talent that Jesus is referring to is the gospel. That's what he is entrusting. Or maybe it's, uh, maybe it's our spiritual gifts by the Spirit. That's what he's entrusting. I think that's completely in the wrong direction to go with this parable. I think this parable is intentionally vague, intentionally broad. It's designed to sweep up everything. Okay? So he's talking about money. He's talking about an outrageous amount of money. He's doing it for the purpose of sweeping up everything. Everything. Okay? So as we apply this, we should be making the widest application possible. Widest application possible. So we entrust, verse 15, to one, five, to another, two, to the third, one. And then I want you to see this expression right here. Uh, In fact, underline it in your Bible, according to his own ability. If you don't have that underlined, underline it. 
according to his own ability. Greek word dunamis capacity is another way to translate. According to his own capacity. Okay? Very, very important. What that means is that the master is making an individual determination of the capacity of each of the three slaves, and he is entrusting to their care that which they can handle. Some can handle more, some can handle less. And so the master, knowing that, gives to them, entrusts to them, the amount of wealth that is proper uh, for their capacity. Okay? That's the one requirement. Invest what I give you. Invest what I give you. That's the requirement. Okay? I'm going to give you just what you need, just what you can handle, not any more, not any less, but I want you to invest what I entrust to you. That's the requirement, one requirement. Secondly, two approaches. Beginning in verse 16, two approaches. The first approach is action, Verses 16 and 17, the other approach is avoidance. Verse 18, okay? One requirement, invest. Two approaches, action or avoidance. Okay, you see it right here. Verse 16, action. Immediately, immediately, the one who had received the five talents went and traded with them and gained five more talents. In the same manner, the one who had received the two talents gained two more. Notice the word immediately, without delay. The slave got to work as soon as the entrustment was made. He set about the process of investing what had been entrusted to him. Remember I told you, stewardship is not about saving. Stewardship is about investing. And so he begins immediately to show initiative. That's a good word. He shows initiative to invest that which has been entrusted to him. And so does the second slave. The second slave. They immediately begin to show that kind of initiative. Now, people wonder, how do you, uh, you know, how do you turn five talents into ten? How do you turn two into four? You know, and so forth. And the answer is, that's irrelevant. Okay? It's really outside the parable. If you like, it's probably speculating on commodities or real estate. That would be my guess. Okay, but again, it's really outside the storyline. It doesn't really matter. The point of it is, is that they acted immediately. They showed action. They showed initiative. Without delay, they, they acted in the master's best interests. The master's best interests. Action. That's one approach. The other approach, the contrary approach, verse 18, is avoidance. Avoidance, verse 18. But, contrast, he who received the one talent went away and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. Rather than taking a risk, rather than showing any kind of initiative, rather than, than attempting in any way to engage in any kind of commercial activity to, to, to gain the increase with what had been entrusted to him, this third slave goes out and resorts to a common practice of that day, which was to hide it. To hide it. Matthew, we'll turn to Matthew 13, verse 44. Jesus uses another parable, talks about a stumbling across a treasure hidden in a field, right? Listen, in the, in, in the Middle East, and in particular in the area of Jerusalem, it's constantly being invaded and overrun by various marauding armies and, and so forth. It was very common in that day to take a threefold strategy. You would keep one-third of your wealth in jewelry, and you would wear it on your person. That's your bug-out bag. That's your getaway money. You would have another one-third of your wealth, which you would use to operate. And you have one-third of your wealth. You would dig a hole in the ground, and you would bury it, because then if all was lost and you were driven from the land, someday you could come back and you would find your wealth again. Okay? That's common. That was a common approach. So what the slave has done, you need to understand, it's not like he did some crazy, outrageous thing that no one ever heard of, Right? He did what was a, a common strategy to preserve capital. Dig a hole in the ground, bury it. But it is directly disobedient to the will of the master, as we will see. And thus reveals there is something deeply flawed about this slave. Something flawed. 
As one writer says, quote, he says, keeping it in this way meant there was no possibility of loss, but it also meant there was no possibility of gain. Capital preservation was not what he had been instructed to do. So, to a, one requirement, invest, two approaches, action, avoidance, one response. And notice as the parable develops here, the, the majority of the text deals with the response. Okay? It deals with the response. One response. Verse 19, now after a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Eventually he comes. A long time, it says, but the day of reckoning is here. The day of reckoning. And so he calls the slaves before him one at a time to give an accounting for what they have done. What kind of steward are you? Verse 20. The one who had received the five talents came up and brought five more talents, saying, Master, you entrusted five talents to me. See, I have gained five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. So he evaluates the, the slave's stewardship, right? And he praises him. And what does he praise him for? He praises him for his, his industry in doubling the amount of capital, doubling the investment. And he calls it uh, that he is faithful, right? He is faithful in a few things, faithful with a few things. Verse 23, he will therefore be rewarded. And notice the reward, I love it. More responsibility, that's the first part of the reward. And then you will enter into the joy of your master. Listen, the joy of your master, in context here, is the millennial kingdom. It is the Messiah's kingdom. It is the master's earthly kingdom. That's the joy he will enter into. You will come into the kingdom. But I wanted to, for a moment, just camp on the first part of the reward. Faithful with a few things, great. I am going to give you more to do. How... Un-American. <laughs> How un-American, right? No, wait a minute. I want a real reward. How about, you know, the riches and the life of leisure and whatever? And he says, no, 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 no. Faithful with a few? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to enlarge your stewardship opportunities because you have shown capacity for more. That's, that's exciting, I think. I think it's exciting. More responsibility? I think it's exciting. More opportunity to bless the master. More opportunity. Notice the second slave. He, uh, he has a smaller amount of capital to, to begin with. Verse 22. Right? The one came who had received the two talents came up and said, Master, you entrusted two talents to me. See, I have gained two more talents. Master said to him, well done, good and faithful slave. You are faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Same reward. Isn't that interesting? One guy makes, you know, uh, he has five and he gets five more. And, and he gets more responsibility and he enters into the kingdom. One has two, he gets two more. He is given the same reward. I will give you more responsibility. You're coming into the kingdom. Why? because they were each acting according to their capacity, verse 15. The guy who only had two wasn't responsible to make ten out of it. He was only responsible to make four. The guy who had five was responsible to make ten. What is the point of evaluation? Did you do the best with what you have been given? Did you do your best with what has been entrusted to you? Are you faithful, right? You see it there. Well done, good and faithful slave. Each one doing according to their ability. And then we have the third slave. And what a contrast we have. Verse 24. And the one also who had received the one talent came up and said... Master, I knew you to be a hard man, 
reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. What an interesting response, huh? He begins immediately here by, by attacking the master's character. You are a hard man. You're a hard man. And then he, then he defines with a, with a pair of expressions, which I think are identical, basically saying the same thing, an identical expression uh, about what it means. When I say you're a hard man, this is what I mean. And what I mean is that you profit off of other people's labor. You are a man who is profiting off of other people's labor. You, you reap a harvest that you haven't sown. You gather a seed where you haven't scattered it. Uh, scattered it. You profit off of other people's labor. Beyond that, verse 25, not only are you a hard man, but I was afraid. I was afraid of you. And I went away and hid your talent in the ground. See, here is what is yours. This entire response is bogus. It's phony. Is fraudulent. And in fact, the master will call it lazy and wicked. If you know this about me, the master will say, if you really know this about me, then, um, then why didn't you put the money with the bankers, right? Verse 26. The master answered and said to him, you wicked, lazy, slave. You knew that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have put my money in the bank. And on my arrival, I would have received my money back with interest. Listen, I, I think the master is being sarcastic personally, but, you know, if you like, the master can really be a hard man in this parable. It still doesn't change anything. Because what he says is if, if this is true about me, if this is really who I am, and you had a responsibility to invest what I've given to you. What in the world did you do burying it in the ground? What did you think? I was going to be happy about that? That, that somehow when you, when you dig it up and it's all covered in dirt, you bring it back to me and you say, here, here, here's, what, here's what you entrusted to me. I'm giving it back to you. That I'm going to say what? Well done, thanks. Not at all. Not at all. Your life is, a, is fraudulent. Your excuse is phony. The reality of the matter is you're lazy and you're wicked. Because if you really were afraid, you really thought me to be a hard man, you thought I, that I profited off of other people's labor and so forth, well, then put it in the bank. At least bring me back my capital with, with some kind of accrued interest attached to it. The very fact that you did nothing with it shows me that you were deliberately avoiding my command deliberately contradicting my instructions to you. You ought to put the money, verse 27, in the bank. And on my arrival, I would have received my money back with interest. Therefore, take away the talent from him and give it to the one who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has, more shall be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who does not have, even what he does have, shall be taken away. Throw out the worthless slave into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Your faithlessness, your phony stewardship, your insulting response... Your lazy, wicked behavior merits only one thing, not a second chance, but exclusion from Messiah's kingdom. Enter into the joy of your master, he says to the, to the first and to the second. To this one, he says, throw that man out. Throw that man out. This is the judgment to come. This is the evaluation of the, of the living Jewish people at the, at the time of Messiah's return. He will evaluate the nation. And those who have shown themselves faithful to him will be invited into his presence in the kingdom. And those that are not will be snatched away like they were in the days of Noah. Into utter darkness. 
Some people are troubled a little bit by verses 28 and 29, and they're thinking, well, what's the deal with that? Take it away from him, give it to the guy who's got five. He's already got five. Well, why would you take it away and give it to the guy who's already got five? Well, simple enough. More responsibility, right? He's already proved himself faithful with it, but entrusted to him, so give him more because he, he can handle it. He's, he's one whose priorities are in the right place. This is a kingdom principle, by the way. This kingdom principle, those who, who, uh, who, who have more will be given abundance, and those who have left, even what, or less, even what they have will be taken away. Jesus speaks of this before. It's, it's, it, depending where it's used, it can be speaking of the Jewish people who think they're entitled by virtue of their birthright, their descent from Abraham, to have a place at Messiah's table. And he was saying it will be taken away from you. And, and in Matthew chapter 8, and verses 10 and 12, he says it will be given to the Gentiles, and they will come in and sit at the table. Here it's spoken about responsibility. The responsibility, the stewardship, will be taken from the one who is unfaithful, and it will be given to the one who is faithful. Beloved, if we could uh, boil this all down to one very simple statement, it would be this. Faithfulness reveals character, and character reveals belief. Faithfulness reveals character, character reveals belief. How do we know whether we believe? What effect does it have upon our life? What effect does it have upon our life? Where are our commitments? Where is our passion? Where is our love? We say we love, and when we say we love, it needs to show up. It needs to show up. Now, I think the message in this parable, I mean, it, it clearly could, could be used to sort of um, beat the sheep. But I, I find it encouraging, actually. What I, what I find encouraging about this is, is still there in verse 15, entrusted to each one according to what? Their ability, their capacity. See, what that means is, is that God is not going to entrust to me that which is beyond the ability to do. For me to do. I'm, talking about, I'm not talking about my own strength and you know, walking in the Spirit and, re- and relying on the Spirit of God and so forth. But, but God has called me to certain things and he has equipped me to certain things. It's beyond my capacity to sing a solo. I'm not called to that. I'm not called to that. Some of you are. And each and every one of us, we, we, we have certain capacities, and we're called to invest those. So, so I find this parable amazingly encouraging, amazingly encouraging. Is that God, who knows you intimately, is entrusted to you a certain place in the vineyard, a certain corner of the vineyard, if you allow me that. And you'll be faithful there. And you'll be called to account for that. You're not called to account for, for my place in the vineyard. And I'm not a called to account for yours. Each of us called for our own. So in the time remaining here, let's, let's ask a couple of questions. Sort of introspective kind of questions, right? What has Christ entrusted to you? What has Christ entrusted to you? Not what, Christ, what has Christ entrusted to your husband or to your children or to your parents or to your friends. Or, you know what I'm saying? What has Christ entrusted to you? What is your capacity? What is it that he is expecting you to invest for his glory? So asking that question to myself, I, I just started to jot some things down. The first thing that came to mind, there's no particular uh, order or rhyme or reason to the list. It's just stuff that popped into my head. The first thing that popped into my head was education. Some have very fine educations. Some of us. Some of us, in in the providence of God, have, have been given the most amazing opportunities. We have gone to some very good schools. What are we doing with it? 
How are we investing the education that has been entrusted to us for the glory of God? It's a good question to ask yourself. In fact, if you're, if you're involved in academic pursuits right now, maybe you're in the thick of it. Maybe some of you, you know, you're in college, you're in graduate school, you're in high school, whatever. And you're thinking, ah, oh, what am I doing? Good question. What are you doing? <laughs> and why are you doing? Are you there just to, so you get a good job, make more money, retire early? Or do you understand that, that according to the, to the unique capacity, that, you know, your, your, your abilities, that God is entrusting this to you to use for his glory. How about relationships? What relationships have been entrusted to you? We all have our, we have our circles, right? We have people that we're, that we're interacting with and and you got your circle, and I've got mine, and, and he's got his, and she's got hers. And, and there may be a little overlap, but generally speaking, we have our circles. What that means is there are, there are certain people that, that you have relationship with that gives you an opportunity to speak to them about the gospel that is far more natural, far more winsome than a total stranger. It's so easy to to say, okay, you know what, Uh, yeah, I've got this friend at work, you know what, I'm just going to invite him to church and let the professionals, you know, save him. It's kind of like going to buy a car, right? You know, first you see the salesman, and then uh, they leave you waiting until the sales manager comes in and closes the deal, right? It's not the right approach. Not the right approach. How are you investing the relationships? Children. God has entrusted to some children, some one, some ten, some more. What are we doing with our children? How are we we handling that entrustment, right? Because, you know, they don't belong to us. They're, They're on loan to us. Children are on loan from God. They belong to Him. And so he entrusts them to us as a stewardship for a, for a period of time to raise them in the fear and admonition of the Lord and then release them. So what are we doing with all of that? Influence. Influence. What kind of influence has God entrusted us with? Some people are, you know, you're real, some of you are pretty powerful people. You have business situations, or you're in positions of authority at work, you're managers, you're, you know, owners of a business. Some of you are in, in, uh, in public service in areas of fire and police and military. And I mean, there's all kinds of influence that's been entrusted to you. What are you doing with your influence? That's a stewardship issue. It's a stewardship issue. We talk about the gospel for sure. Right? We've all been entrusted with that. So that, that, you know, if you're a follower of Christ this morning, everybody gets that entrustment. We all get the gospel. What are we doing with it? What are we doing? That doesn't mean we're all called to, you know, to go to the other side of the world and be a missionary. And, but we all have the words of life. We all have the words of life. Oh, I had to put it down here. Um, wealth. I mean, we're wealthy. Some of us more wealthy than others. It is an entrustment. What are we doing with what has been entrusted to us? How about Bible knowledge? Some people have great Bible knowledge. What a blessing to, a, to grow up in an environment where, you, where you've been taught the Bible since childhood and, and you know a lot about the Bible. I mean, you really do. But that's a stewardship question. What are you doing with what you know? What am I doing with what I know? Speaking ability. Some of you are public speakers. I've heard you. You're, you're 
No problem at all. Stand up in front of a crowd, open in your mouth, you're able to speak, you speak with clarity, you speak with organization, your vocabulary is, you know, is good, diction strong. That's an entrustment. That's an entrustment. What, what, are, we, what are we doing with all of that stuff? It's, it doesn't terminate on us. It's not, it's not for our glory. Some of you are incredibly organized. You've got, you've got amazing organizational abilities. For those that don't have them, they, they, are, they are just wowed by that, right? I mean, we all have 24 hours in a day, isn't that right? But some people can accomplish amazing amounts in 24 hours, and some people accomplish far less, according to their abilities. Earlier, we said, you know, we... We're looking for, for a few folks that God has entrusted you with amazing organizational abilities to bless and serve the body here in January for luncheon. You know who you are. You, you, if you're really well organized, you know. Because it irritates you when everybody else is not. <laughs> right? I'll be honest now. Right? You know, what's wrong with them? I can't see you just do this and this and this and this and this and this. Anybody would know that. No? Well, actually, you know that. <laughs> because God has entrusted you with that. So it's a, what's that? For others, it's compassion. Did you ever think about that? I mean, we're all called to a certain level of compassion, to be sure. But some people are just really, really compassionate people. And, and, how do I know that? Because, because they're always there whenever anybody's hurting. They're, they're always there. They've got like compassion radar. And they, they can tell when somebody is hurting. And, dunk, they're there. Wonderful, wonderful entrustment of God. How about time? It's an entrustment of time, isn't there? God gives us time. He expects us to invest time profitably. How about health? Just another one. Some of you have great health, strong, robust character. Others, your health is not as strong. I get it. I go out work in the yard for about an hour and a half, and I'm toast. Getting old, I guess, but... I mean, some people, you know, they are really robust. They, they can really work hard for a, for a long day at hard physical labor, and, and they're good. Beloved, that's a gift. That's an entrustment. And, and you probably won't recognize it until and unless you, the yourself's capacity is diminished, and then you'll look back at that and you'll go, whoa. I can remember back in the day. If, if, if God has entrusted you with a really robust health right now, don't waste it. Don't waste it. Kind of goes with the next one, the vigor of youth and the wisdom of age. Right? The, the, the youth brag about their strength. And they have strength. The aged have wisdom, or should. These are stewardships. These are entrustments. Don't waste your vigor. Don't keep your wisdom to yourself. Oh, my mind was fertile. How about mechanical abilities? Some people have amazing mechanical abilities, don't you think? They can fix anything. My father is like that. My father can fix anything. Anything. Some of you are like that. You just, you just look at it. It just makes sense to you. It just, you know, all right, this goes here and that goes there. You take out this screw and this comes apart. And, you know, I'm standing there thinking, oh, I can probably get it open with a hammer, but I don't know how I'm going to get it back together. <laughs> right? So if God has entrusted you with mechanical ability. He has done it for a purpose. Do you know what the purpose is? Do you know where to invest it? Do you know how to invest it? Artistic abilities. Right? Some are very artistic, able to, able to use that for the glory of God. Musical abilities. 
helping hands, right? The helping hands people, it kind of goes with compassion. They're the people who are always there, always helping. You know, giving people rides when they need them, bringing them a meal, just all kinds of stuff. All kinds of stuff. Beloved, God has, has entrusted to us all kinds of diversity. All kinds of diversity. And he's entrusted it according to the capacity that he, has, that he has created us with. And he wants us to invest it for his glory. And he will call us to account for it. He will. Not in the sense of we'll be excluded from a size kingdom and cast into, into eternal darkness with weeping and judging. No, that, the parable is talking there about the, the true followers of Messiah and the false you know, professors. Those that claim to follow Jesus and don't. I, I'm just talking about a general principle of stewardship by application from this. Okay? But I think it works. And I think the, the question, maybe as we close this out, is just to ask ourselves this. Are, are, how eager are we? How eager are we to make a profit with what God has entrusted to us? Heaven help us. Heaven save us. From an attitude which would basically say, here's your capital back. I didn't lose anything. But let us to be risk takers. Right? For the glory of God. Let's pray. Father, may your spirit to cause his word to hit home in our hearts in exactly the right place and in the right way. Every one of us here this morning. There's something we need to hear from this, this basic principle. So, Father, I pray that you would help us to be willing to do a little, of int little introspection, even perhaps invite someone, a close friend, in. Ask them to help us evaluate a little bit. Who, how has God made me? What do you see in me? That we could, we could be good stewards. Father, it is our heart's desire. We love Christ. We want to invest for his glory. We confess that we get drawn off course so easily. The things of this world entice us. Difficulties sideswipe us. And, but Father, in a time like this, sitting here this morning, hearing the word, we're brought to that place. Let us go here with, a, with an encouragement that there's not a heavy burden of guilt somehow upon us instead just a joyful recognition of how you have made us and perhaps a refocusing of priorities that we could invest them most profitably how we look forward to the day we will be in the presence of our Savior how much we want to hear well done good and faithful servant accomplish your good work in us we pray for Jesus sake amen